Good morning. Hope you're ready for church. We've been doing it for 30 minutes already. <laughs> Good to see you today. You know, this is a, a great day. We, not because it's Super Bowl Sunday. You know, because it's Sunday. All right. That alone makes it a great and glorious day. Glad to see you today. We're going to start a new series of messages today. You might remember about 10, 12, 14 years ago, I preached on Wednesday nights. Did part of it, I think, when we started the church early on about Gideon as a character study. Then we enlarged on a Wednesday night study back around maybe 9, 10, 11 years ago. We talked about this, and we did about 18 messages on Gideon. But just for about the next four weeks, I want to focus on this character study, condense a lot that we shared in a very expanded format, and look at this particular individual of Scripture. The theme of the whole message is moving from cowardice to courageous. Uh, far too many uh, people living in the coward mode than the courageous mode today. Uh, we can all find ourselves in that if we're not very careful. And if you don't think it's possible, just hold on. Amen. There's just ways of, 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 uh, of that things happen and that God allows to happen in our life that can bring us to a place where we're not standing when we ought to be standing and not being what we've been called to be. And certainly if we learn anything from the Scripture, we're called to be something far different than what the world uh, offers. Amen? We live, live different lives. So we're going to look at this series of messages. Hopefully it'll be something that God speaks to your heart about. This is one of those characters in the Bible that, that, uh, that I just love to do a character study on because there's just, there's just so much here. And there's so much here because he is so much like you and I. You and me. <laughs> he really is. And maybe you can't relate. Well, I hope by the time we get through the first of this, you can relate pretty easily. Not what we pretend to be, but what we can really be. And how that we can really just miss the mark so often and not see what God is doing. We'll read in just a moment in Judges chapter 6. And we're going to look at about 10, 11, 12, 13, somewhere in those verses. But let me give you a little preview of what's happened here contextually in the scripture. Uh, the children of Israel, because of Barak and Deborah, have just experienced 40 years of incredible peace. The presence of God, the glory of God, the nation has not been in conflict. And it's 40 years of extended peace for them. And it's been a beautiful, glorious time. But it starts out in chapter 6, uh, verse 1, starts out, and, but the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. The children of Israel. And then it says, for the next seven years, because of their disobedience, that God began to send, you know, troubles and trials and chastening their way. And he did it by the hand of the Midianites. And it wasn't like some of the other times where you had the Babylonians come in and conquer the land and occupy the land and carry many off into captivity. This was a different kind of deal. Under, under Gideon, these seven years, the Midianites would come in and it was kind of like long distance, you know, attacks. They'd come in, at least for that day and age, long distance just means, might mean continent to continent. These guys had hordes, is the way the scriptures, like locusts, they would come in on camels. I mean, from as far as 100 miles away, if you study the geography in the, of the scripture, that's being, they'd come in for 100 miles away, they, they'd attack. They didn't stay occupied. They just came in and they would attack and they were, they were raiding bandits. They would come in and they would do it at certain times of the year, like in the harvest times, the blessing times, and they'd come in and just pillage the land. I mean, they'd take everything, destroy everything in, in the wake of them coming, and then they would retreat back to, to the land of Midian. By the time everything looked good, everything's going well, crops are coming up, it's time for the harvest, they'd harvest, here'd come the Midianites, come in like a locust and just devour the land. It said it was so bad that the children of Israel began to make for themselves caves in the mountains and hiding out. You know, their lives were extremely, extremely miserable. Now, that's the, that's the big picture of what's going on here. As you open up into chapter 6, they rebelled against God. If you follow the history of Israel, they had a bad habit of taking their culture, which was supposed to be unique, holy, and godly, and letting it deteriorate through compromise and begin to mix in Baal worship and idolatry and marry and intermarry the, with the nations that God had told them not to because of that wicked influence those nations would have upon them. So they began to do all those things that God told them not to do, and now trouble comes. But when you open up to the book of, uh, in chapter 6, down around verse 11, God begins to speak, and he says, The angel of the Lord came and sat under the oak that was in Oprah, which belonged to Joash the Abrazite, as his son Gideon was beating out wheat in the winepress in order to save it from the Midianites. So they wouldn't see it. The angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, the Lord is with you, O valiant warrior. Verse 13 says, And then Gideon said, 
Oh, oh Lord. Oh, I probably say it like this. Oh, my Lord. <laughs> oh, my Lord. If the Lord is with us, then why has all this happened to us? And where are his miracles, which our father told us about? Did not the Lord bring us from Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and given us into the hand of Midian. Now, when you look at the response to the presence of, the, of God's message and God's word here, it's not unusual when you think about it. Many of us, in the midst of a word from the Lord or God speaking to the hearts, have responded in such the same way. Because we're living in, 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 in this world that's, it, well, it, one of the favorite embraces in times of crisis is, is a victim mentality. You know, you're the reason all this happened to me. If you hadn't done that, or if they hadn't done this, and, I mean, it goes back to the Garden of Eden, you know. Uh, it's the snake, she said. And he said, no, it's the woman. And finally, Lord, it's your fault. You gave her to me. Yeah. But in fact, every excuse you might have or I might have, We'll let it kind of simmer down and boil out a little bit and get down to, the, to the, the cream of the cream of what it really is. And we're usually blaming God. Usually it's the brunt of every bad thing. It's your fault. God, you did this to us because we're so ignorant. And that's pretty much the culture that we live in. It's somebody else's problem. It's the business I work for. It's my wife. It's my husband. If I didn't have these kids, they were so rebellious. It's, 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 it's my neighbors. It's my, pro you know, and all, it's my parents. It's, a, it's the gene pool, which I share, you know. It's tainted. <laughs> They're all tainted. <laughs> it's called sin. But yet, instead of just taking some ownership and some responsibility and just maybe for a moment realize, you know, I, I may be part of the problem here. We refuse to do that. And here, when the angel of the Lord comes to bring deliverance and to bring and, and to rise to the occasion, to do a work in the midst of the people, this is the response. Oh, my Lord. Sure. I've heard that Jesus stuff and that Christian stuff and that revival stuff all my life. If God is for me. You always say this, but if God's for me, why, why am I going through this? What do I have to deal with this? What do I have to suffer with it? Why am I going through this? And where, God said he's with us. Where are all the miracles? And here you have it. It almost seems, you know, for a moment that, that when that this, this messenger shows up that perhaps he's mocking the mighty man of valor. How mighty, the brave hero is basically it. Oh, brave hero, the Lord is with you. Oh, my. If God is with me. Now, if you follow, again, in, in the context of everything, remember that where they're at and all they're going through. Let me give you a little bit of an overview of, what, of what's going on. One we said, they're being devoured by the Midianites. They come in, they don't occupy, they just steal everything. And they're ripped off. Not only that, not only being occupied and they're being ripped off, the, the next thing he talks about has, they're, they're defeated and it's their land. This is what God gave them. They're, this is the promised land and they're hiding out and they're defeated there. Whatever they get is very limited. The harvest that comes in is stolen. They just have a little bit they eke out to keep for themselves, and, it's, and then they're ripped off again. There's no lasting fruit. In fact, it's absolute fear that these people, they're hiding. They can't deal with the problem. They can't deal with the enemy. I'm just sick and tired of it. I don't know how to relate this anymore. I'm just, I'm just, I just know something else bad is going to happen. You just know it. I mean, what's next is the mentality and the mindset. And absolutely, you add to that frustration. You hear that in Gideon's voice, oh, my Lord. And he's speaking directly to a messenger, oh, my Lord. And whether he's, and whether he's speaking in the context of, oh, my Lord, or oh, my Lord, it's the same. There's this voice of discontent and this voice of frustration, and there's no victory for anybody that lasts. As soon as it looks like they may get something from all the work and all the effort and all the labor, it's gone. Boy, but isn't that true of many Christians today? You know, you look through down the list, you know, they're just, 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 you know, they're being spoiled, as it says here, in their own land. Not much fruit in their spiritual life, peace, joy, victory, all those things that are supposed to be part of our life. No satisfaction. I'm trying to serve the Lord, but there's no joy in it. I'm kind of eking out, just kind of getting through what, what, you know, there's just no lasting victory here. I'm afraid, I'm just kind of living fear. What, what can happen next? What's, what's, what's the next deal on the list in my life? What, what's the use? It's, it's interesting. Catch Gideon, he, what's he doing? He says he's beating out wheat in the wine press. 
Now, the name Gideon is unique. It means a hewer, someone who cuts down, like somebody who takes down big trees. But instead of hewing and taking down the big obstacles, he's beating little pieces of grain. And the process was a beating of the grain while it's on the hard floor. Then it'd be shoveled into a, to a, like a big sheet where it'd be taken outside and on four corners people would stand and throw it up in the air. As the wind would blow, the grain itself was heavy enough to fall straight down. But with the wind blowing, the shaft would be blown away and the fruit would remain and come back down. But now, where is it? He's not outside doing this. He's doing it in the most unlikely place in the world. You know? He's hiding in the wine press. Now, the wine press was a large, large vat that you could walk into, but on the upper levels, grapes would be loaded and, and they'd be crushed and the wine would come down and be filled in the barrels and vats below. Well, he's, you know, there's no grapes to crush. They've all been taken. So he's thinking, well, if I just hide in here, they won't see it and they won't take it. I can keep it. You can see him in there, beating that grain out having a stick or whatever it is to... <laughs> you know, just frustrated. So much so, it doesn't say when he noticed him, but sitting over under the big old oak tree at Oprah, there's an angel watching. How often have the angels sit down and watched us in our stupidity? Amen. How often have we been there and it's kind of like, and you saved them. <laughs> and they're still like this. <laughs> now, I don't know. There's lots of places in Scripture where there are just angels or angels. There's other places where it's obviously the Lord Jesus who shows up. And as a messenger, it really doesn't give us all the insights here. But the Lord, the messenger, the Lord's messenger, Joshua, I think, is very clear when he's called the captain of the host of the Lord. The commander in chief is what the terminology means. That's obviously Jesus here. And if this is the Lord or his messenger, it's still the same weight, all right? He does offer him, later in the story, he brings an act as worship, and he offers a, a goat, a, a kid, a, you know, and some offerings that go along with it. And the Lord, the angel of the Lord or whatever, touches it with a staff, and it's received. So, what, you know, so there's some inclination. But either way, if it's an angel or if it's Jesus himself, you know, the attitude is so clearly what the attitude of so many uh, Christians are like today. They're kind of like Gideon, just kind of hiding out, trying to eke out what we can get in our spiritual life and hold on to it. And, you know, but there's frustration and there's doubt. And, and too many people are, are, are they're just like Gideon, in, if they get honest at least, in that same regard. Because Gideon gets to this point and he's so frustrated when the, when the Lord speaks to him, he's, he, he's, he, he gives two questions. One, God's with us, then why is all this happening to me? God's not with me. If God were really with me in this deal, this would not be happening to me. How many of you ever felt that way in our life? I mean, some, some difficulty, some crisis, some dilemma came, a conflict. And we're thinking, why, why am I having to go do this? You know, where God, where are you in all this? You know, I'm trying to at least be that little living to feed my family here. And I mean, you've already sent all these terrible, you allowed these folks to come into our land. I mean, I thought you loved me. You felt that way? I thought you loved me. And then he asked this one. If you're for us, then where are your miracles? I mean, I, I read the story. I've, I've heard the book. I, uh, you know, we have the five books of Moses. There's the story of deliverance. Where you, how you delivered the children of Israel. You know, I'm not too far removed from the generation of Deborah and Barak or from the story of Joshua. All right? where you, you split the, the Jericho wide open, they walked across, it was on dry ground, and you, they, decon they conquered the land of the Canaanites, and you drove them eventually out. I mean, but look at us. What's up? Is that the God of yesterday? Is he not the God of today? Maybe some of you just won't be that honest when you feel that way. Maybe that's it. But I think in reality, if we get real honest, we felt like God's forsaken us at times. But I, I just want to present something here, and I think it's not only relevant to what Gideon's saying, it's relevant to our life because we also at different times have felt perhaps that maybe God's abandoned us in some regard or that God's not present. Catch what happens here. He felt he's forsaken, but if you look at the story carefully, you begin to understand very clearly that he has not 
been forsaken any more than we've been forsaken. First of all, it tells us that the chastening was there because God allowed the chastening to come. Now, you don't have to be a theological genius to go to the book of Hebrews and realize that God is our heavenly Father, and as He is our Father and we are His children, that He will discipline His children who are unruly, His children who need to grow, His children who need to mature. He's a good Father. In fact, the writer of Hebrews makes it clear that if we are not chastened, then we're not saved. We're not children of God. So the fact that you're being chastened is evidence that God is present. Now, I don't know about you, I don't like chastening. Do you? No, we don't like chastening. I, I, you know, I, I, never, I never got that deal. It's going to hurt me more than it hurts you. I used it <laughs> with my kids. And as a parent, I began to get a little closer insight, but as a child, I didn't get it. I didn't get it then. And, and, and here, he, here he is, and he's saying, oh, if God's for me, and, and hey, get in and slow down for a moment. Go back to verse 1. The children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, it says. And whenever we respond in ways in our life that are not righteous and not godly and not like Jesus, simply put, then don't think for a moment that you're somehow exempt from God dealing with you. He loves you too much to let you drift. He loves you too much to let you go. He knows left to your own devices, you'll destroy yourself. We've already shown the propensity and the tendency to do that, haven't we? On more than one occasion, he says, listen, I love you enough to discipline you. But not only that, if you listen carefully to the story in Judges 6 and verses 7 and 10, he starts talking about how God also sent them a prophet. So God has shown his presence there by chastening them, He's shown his presence there by sending them a prophet to correct them, to say, hey, we've sinned. We need to repent. It's time to get right with God. And they ignored that. In fact, I stand here today as a sign that God loves you. Be careful. I'm not being arrogant. Thank God for every brother or sister in Christ who would have enough courage to say, hey, that's wrong. That doesn't please God. You need to make a decision to get right with God in that area of your life. Because they stand as a sign that God still loves you. Their word of warning, their word of encouragement, their word, whatever it might be, it might even seem negative at that point, to repent. They are an evidence that God loves you. He sent this word, and over and over and over again throughout the word of God, you see clearly that God loves his people because he continues to send his word. He sends a messenger of his word and speaks to people's hearts. Where's God? He's talking to you. Pay attention. What's God doing? He's dealing with your heart. Pay attention. Too often we just don't want to recognize where we are in the conflict. And now, not only that, add to that, okay, he sent chastening, he sent a preacher, but all know the angel of the Lord himself, he's with Gideon. The angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, the Lord is with you. The Lord's with you. I don't feel that. I'm sorry. The Lord's with you. I don't understand that. I'm sorry. The Lord is with you. But what about the Midianites? The Lord is with you. But what about this problem? The Lord is with you. I don't think I'm going to be able to get enough grain out here to feed my family. The Lord is with you. And if the Lord is with you, then you pretty much got everything you need to do. In other words, what I'm trying to tell you, Gideon, the Lord hadn't abandoned you at all. He hadn't abandoned you at all. In fact, he is showing himself, clearly identifying himself within the chastening, within the prophet's word. With my presence here, he's saying, the Lord's with you. I, mean, I think you ought to get it by now. That's three times. The Lord's with you. If this wasn't happening, then you could obviously have every right and reason to say, where is the Lord? But he's shown himself that he's with you. And so we, we need to rejoice in the context that even when chastening comes and we feel convicted about our sin, or we're sitting in a sermon or a Bible study and somebody's saying something that's bothering us and we don't like to hear what we're hearing, we're getting frustrated, maybe upset about what the preacher's saying because it's ruffling our sheets up. Well, it's time to get out of bed. It's time to respond. That's an obvious sign. God loves you. God's speaking to your heart. Don't resist it, you know. Well, I don't like the messenger. I'm sorry. The message is, is what's important. We listen to the message most of all. 
So the Lord appears. You say, well, that's Gideon. What about me? Well, the Lord appears and speaks to us the same way. The Bible tells us that he's appeared to us by his son. I love this passage in Hebrews uh, chapter 1 when it says this. Uh, it says in verse 1 to God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers and the prophets, had he been in the prophets in many portion, portions and in many ways, I mean, the miracles, everything, that in these last days, God has spoken to us in his son, Jesus. And he's made Jesus the heir of all things. And Jesus is the one who made all things. And he's the one, obviously, he's given him the badge of authority here. He has the authority. He's the one who speaks to us, and he's the one that matters. He's the one who speaks to us, and what he says is right. He's the one who speaks to us, and what he says, that's reality. He's the one who speaks to you, and you can count on his word because he's the Lord over all things. So don't make step back and say, well, God, God hasn't spoken to me. Yes, he has. He sent his son, Jesus Christ. And there's a clear message in the gospel for you. There's a clear message of God's love for you. There's a clear demonstration by Jesus sacrificing his life for your sin of God's love for you. God is present. God has sent his son, and he's spoken to all of us now by his son. That's the first word, but it doesn't stop there. God's also, as with Gideon, he's spoken to us by his word. Again, how many times? Every Sunday I'm going to do this. You might as well get ready for it. Please don't get tired of it. This is no ordinary book. This is the Word of God. This is the most important thing you have in your possession. It's more important and more valuable than your wedding band, your wedding ring, your home, your car, and all your assets combined. This is the most important thing you own. This is the most important thing you own. This is the most important thing in your life. This is the most important thing you will ever possess in this world. And if it is so important, then I'll, you know, I'll start reading it. Maybe I'll not just start reading it. Maybe I'll start memorizing it because look at all the promises about memorizing God's Word. Maybe I ought to meditate on it. Maybe I ought to... This might be difficult. Try studying it. Now, folks, again, somehow that... Pew, right over our head almost every Sunday we say it. It's a living book. It's a spiritual book. It doesn't make sense to the world. But yet there are things that God has to say to you within the context of those pages that are more important than anything else you will listen to on TV, anything you will read in any magazine. It is the most important thing in the world. And God said, I have spoken to you by my word. And if you look at the word, then you start realizing the same thing he said to Gideon is the same thing he says to us. We are more than conquerors. We're overcomers. We're courageous. We're not cowards. We're the called of God. We're the chosen of God. We're the salt of the earth. We're the light of the world. We're kings unto the Lord. We're priests unto the Lord. All that, where's that come from? It comes from the book. It comes from the book. But guess what if I don't know the book? I don't care how worldly smart I am. I'm really stupid. And that stupidity will be a glaring reality when you stand at the judgment seat of Christ. Ah, oh, God, I've been so dumb. Like David the psalmist, when he continued to live in his immoralities and his sin, he said, how could I have been so stupid? How could I have ignored my teachers? Why didn't I listen to those who taught me? How could I, I, mean, if, I don't know about you, but I've been there where I've just felt like, oh, that's the dumbest thing. I, can't, I am so stupid. Am I the only one falling on the, flat on their face here? <laughs> you know? How could I, I, I know better than that. If I worried if I hid in my heart that I might not live that way. That's my version of it and I might not sin against God. So get in it. Rely on it. Believe it. Hear what God has to say to you. God's speaking to you. God is present with you. He's told you that in his word. Lo, I'm with you always, even to the ends of the earth. You, we have the same thing. But the average Christian is like Gideon in this concept. There's three things that we, we just don't tend to understand or comprehend. And maybe it's that we do understand it. We just don't embrace it. One would be this. The presence, the awesome presence of God. Like Gideon, the Lord's presence is being manifest in this moment and his word's being manifest, you know, and Gideon says, oh, my Lord, God's for me. Just phew, right over his head, right in the midst of his defeat, right over his head. I mean, we'd have revival in a moment if we could get this first one down. Amen? God's present. The presence of the Lord. That's, that's where wisdom comes for. We just realize the presence of God. The presence of God is the, and the fear of God. I mean, that all has to do with the very same concept and the very same thing. Wisdom of God, fear of God, the presence of God. 
The realization that God is near and that God is here and that God is present in my life right now. So while I'm threshing out wheat, hey, these circumstances may be befalling me in my life, but hey, God is here now. So I'm going I'm to trust him. He's going to give me direction when the time comes. He's going to give me clarity when the time comes. He's going to give me instruction when the time I'm going to know what to do when the time comes. So we may be in a situation where we're surrounded by a bunch of people living in sin. Even in the midst of that, God is able to come and meet you there. But not only the, second, the presence of God, we miss the awesome power of God. Where are his miracles? They're abounding all around you. And we fail to see that. You know, sometimes we see it in a very big sense, a, a healing, a great move of God, a doors open we thought would never be possible. We conquer something in our heart and life. But hey, even beyond that, God is just abounding in our lives at all times. If we, if we could just somehow, and, and I think maybe one day when we stand before God, we will, but if we could just see how the flood tide that is pressing against our life every day by Satan and his demons and every influence that he can muster, it, it's like a flood tide. And I almost see it in my heart and mind like Moses crossing the Red Sea and that water walls up on both sides and can't consume them. But it's raging and it's powerful and it's mighty and could destroy us in an instant. But God stays that off our life all the time. I mean, thank God for his awesome power that he gives to us and then puts in us to exercise even ourselves in situations. Glory of God. But then the promises of God gets back to the word of God. Uh, you know, the, the Lord says to Gideon, you go in this thy might. The Lord is with thee. What does that mean? He says... Start taking every step and understand my presence, understand my promise, and understand my power. You go in this thy might. All I have is what you said. That's all you need. And if you'll step out and believe me at that point, then you'll see. But you know, you can't approach your Christian walk with this mindset. Well, when I see it, I'll believe it. How many people say that? All the time here. Well, when I see it, I'll believe it. No. If you want to see it, you have to believe it. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. I'm going to believe God. And if I choose to believe, then I'll see. But if I'm waiting around to see it, to believe it, I won't ever see it there. I've got to see what God says, what his word wants. And, and, you know, at least Gideon had the courage to ask the questions, amen? I think a lot of Christians are just content to live in the mediocrity. I, I, I hate mediocrity. I see it when it gets in my life. I see it when it begins to infect my soul. And I, I just get, you know, and then I start stumbling and struggling in my Christian walk and life. I, Test that, and so do you in your spirit. Don't we? We just, you know, man, it's just it's sickening. We just, I can't believe, you know, man, if people knew what I was really like, man, my wife wouldn't even like me. <laughs> I know some of you would not be well beyond that, bless your heart. I'm coming, just wait for me, all right? Be patient with me. But we see, you know, we just see that stuff well up in our lives. You know, Gideon said, okay, I've, I've had enough. He said, if this is from God, he said, I want to know it. You know, I want to know. And he goes and prepares an offering, you know. If, but you've got to get to that point. I'm just, you know, I want God. It, it, understand, God does not give Gideon a direct answer about why all this is happening to us, if you follow the story, does he? And you say, why didn't he do that? Well, I think he knew his heart. One, every, every Israeli knew that the disobedience to God brought displeasure from the Lord and judgment and chastening and moving of God's hand against their life. Verse 1, Israel sinned. You think that Israel didn't know they'd sinned? You think Gideon didn't know they'd sinned? I think we know when we sin. We just don't want to acknowledge that. We, we have that preferential thing that we get in our life with, with Christianity because we live in the world of decisions and choices. We live in the world of so many opportunities and so many decisions that we can make. I mean, it's like going, you know, I went to a pizza place this last week. Great pizza, man. You walk in there and, and, and it's kind of like Subway. You just pick out what you want on your pizza. Yeah. You like, you get in a Subway like that? You go into Subway and you just pick out what you want. I, I want, I want some spinach on it and on some lettuce but no those red onions I don't want those and the olives ugh, you know don't put that on mine and somebody said well I love olives you know and everybody's got their choices you know I can't do the onions man it gives me gas you know and we just <laughs> we just pick and choose and we put a little salt a little pepper no no salt pepper a little oil little that oil yes put some of that ranch dressing right across the top right in your big jar there you go 
And we get our sandwiches, and, oh, it's so good. But you, don't, you can't approach like God like he's like some divine buffet where you can pick and choose off the, off the table of righteousness what you like. Give me some peace. I love peace and joy. You know, heaven, <laughs> give me a big slice of heaven. You know, <laughs> that holiness, that, that gives me gas. You know, that's that the holy stuff. I, I don't need that. That's for the fanatics. It doesn't work that way. It just doesn't work that way. And when you sit back and you see what you've been eating spiritually in your life, you may realize it's not God's fault. It's not God's fault. It's my fault. Verse 10 says very clearly, they didn't obey me. Which means what? They didn't believe me. Bottom line, they didn't trust me. They didn't trust me. They don't believe me. The only reason I don't obey God is because I choose not to believe him. Right? That's the bottom line. I choose not to have faith. And whatsoever is not of faith is sin. So obviously they all tie together. So when I don't believe God, then I have problems. Say, Brother Joe, okay, I find myself thrashing out the wheat in the wine press. And by the way, folks, the last place you want to hide from the Midianites is in the wine press. They're a bunch of drunks. <laughs> if I'm a Midianite, the first place I'm looking is the wine press. All right? That's where I'm going. It shows our stupidity, doesn't it? What do you do? Well, I think it's pretty simple. First of all, it's simple enough to realize that, hey, where I am, what got me there? I think Gideon knew what got him there. I'm not, I'm not where I need to be with God. Not where I want to be. I don't think I'm where God wants me to be. You know? And I'm, I'm not pursuing that. Realize at this point, there's no reason for you to stay there. It's not who you are. You're trying to be like the world, act like the world, live in the world. He's not going to be happy there. It's the old round peg square hole deal. It's not going to fit. It's not going to work. You're a child of God. You know? We're in this world, but we're out of it. You know? we we're different. We're made to be different. I mean, that was the whole issue with, with God and Abraham and Israel. Different. You're different. I'm going to use you to show what difference like and give the message to the world of what, that God is different. He's holy. He's unique. So I need to be different, not like everybody else. I'm not seeking to blend them. I'm seeking to mix it up. <laughs> Amen. Bring some light onto the situation. You are the child of God. You are the chosen deliverers of this generation. You are the messengers of grace for this world right here, right now. For such a time as this bears an important part of your life. I'm, I'm the light. You're the light. We're the salt. You're the salt. We're the ones who make the difference in the world. We're not the ones who just saturate and take in the world and become like everybody else. And so I, if I can realize who I am, that, that's going to change my world right there. Number one, it's going to give me victory against my, my enemy, the, Satan. And, and we've talked about this before, your spiritual identity. The three questions and the three ways that Jesus was dealt with by the devil, Satan said, who, if you really think you are, if you really are, if you really are, he does that to us all the time. Yes, you are. Yes, I am a child of God. Yes, you are a daughter of God. Yes, you are a son of God. Just, let's, you know, I'm not where I need to be. This is where I need to be. I'm going to move towards that, all right? And I'm going to realize in the process I'm not on my own. The Lord is with me. I'm not, this, I'm not in this deal by myself trying to just pull myself up by the bootstraps and say, I'm going to be spiritual today. I can do it. I can do it. You can't on your own. But God didn't intend for you to do it on your own. He intended you to do it in Christ Jesus. Well, I love the book of Romans. One day we'll just do it. We'll, we'll spend six months in Romans. That's how long it will take. It's the only reason I'm preaching. It takes six months at least to do Romans. But I love it just as a personal study. In Romans chapter 1 and chapter 2, the theme is you're lost. You've got no excuse. You sinned against God. Chapter 3, you're going to die and go to hell. Gentiles lost. Romans lost. Jews are lost. Everybody's lost. Nothing can save you. The wages of your sin is death. Romans chapter 4 and 5 starts leading us into understanding the concept of trusting God and faith in God. If we trust God, we put our faith in God, that's the way to be made righteous. That's the way to be made right with God. That's the way to become a new person. Romans chapter 6, bam, it comes real clear all of a sudden. Hey, I am a new person. I am not what I used to be. I've been crucified with Christ, buried with Christ, raised with Christ. These instruments in my body, this fleshly body, I can choose to use it as an instrument of righteousness or unrighteousness. 
I can surrender my members of my body as slaves to sin, or I can realize I'm free in Jesus Christ. Chapter 7, oh, I know that in my head. There's a problem here. What I want to do, I'm not doing. What I know God wants me to do, I'm not doing. And what I know I shouldn't do, <laughs> and what God doesn't want me to do, oh my Lord, that's what I'm doing. Okay, says, so it gets to the end of chapter 7. Who can deliver me from my dilemma? That's the joy I'm saying. Who can deliver me from this body of sin? With my spirit, I serve the law of God. With my flesh, I serve the law of sin and death. Who can deliver me? He didn't leave us hanging there. Thank God. It's through Christ Jesus, our Lord, that there's an answer. We're not in this alone. Who's with me? Thou art with me. Psalm 73, the Psalm of Asaph, great Psalm. He said, I looked at the prosperity of the wicked, and I almost stumbled. I was a back to backslide until I went into the sanctuary of God, and I saw that you're continually with me. You hold me by my right hand. Chapter 8 just basically gets down to saying, remember, it's not divided in chapters when it's originally written. Chapter 8, he moves to the point saying, hey, okay, there's this, there's this flesh, there's this sin body, but how, you have something else. What do I have? You have the Lord. You have the Spirit of Christ. If you have not the Spirit of Christ, he says in Romans chapter 8, you're none of his. You don't have a chance. You know, there's no way. You're, you're going to die and go to hell. You're going to be hell. You'll be religious, but you'll still go to hell. <laughs> but Christ lives in you. So therefore, since you have Christ in you, you serve a higher law, the law of life and the law of liberty in Christ Jesus, which rises above all the pulling, all the tearing, all the destruction of our flesh. Yeah, I love the way he refers to it as laws and principles. You know, we have the law of gravity, which holds everything down. You know, so we, I'm sure there's some brilliant here. So, well, you know, I just don't know if we need law, the law of gravity. I have trouble with that. We'll jump off the building. All right? <laughs> we'll settle the issue. Right. You know, this, this is always that moment when you get on an airplane, you know, and that law of gravity, then, then I start thinking about it. And I look around, I'm sitting on a plane with three or 400 people, and I'm thinking, they're all fat like me. Then I start thinking, that means they all have big clothes with big suitcases. And I remember, I mean, I took mine at 50 pound limit. It's like 50. And I think I fudged a pound or two. Y'all have traveled, right? And I start thinking, three or 400 people at 50 pounds, that doesn't count the carry on, which weighs probably another 50. Because I know mine did. At least 40, I shoved everything in it. They didn't weigh it, I carried it all. Threw it up overhead. That's smart, huh? Along with everybody else's overhead. And here goes that plane running down the runway. <laughs> Gravity tearing at it. Pulling. You're not going. You're not going. You're not getting off the ground. And all of a sudden, there's another law that kicks into gear. The law of aerodynamics. <laughs> that thing takes off. The law of gravity is still in operation. There's something stronger working. The law of sin and death is still working. There's something stronger that resides in you called the spirit of the living God. Christ lives in you. Well, we have revival right here and now if that break loose in our mind, get loose in our spirit, get loose in our heart. Then you realize what we've been given. The presence of God and the word of God. We've been given Jesus Christ. He's spoken to us, and the Bible says, in these last days. You know what? That Jesus gave us the clearest picture of what it meant to live by faith. You know, he was God. He didn't act as God. Read your Bible. Jesus didn't do those things himself. He says, the miracles you see me do, I don't do those. I mean, he said that himself. He said, the words I'm speaking, those didn't come out of my own initiative. I just didn't make those up. I just didn't speak. My father told me to say those words. Read the Gospel of John. He said, the works that I do, they're my father's works. The words that I say, they're from my father. So that's how we live our life. Jesus showed us we can live a life by faith. But it operates on his word, and it operates in him, and we respond to him. Do not, do not, whatever the condition of your heart and life is at this moment, do not settle for mediocrity. Do not settle in for deadness and coldness. You simply do what Gideon did in the context of all this, and it simply breaks down. You follow his story. He goes and he starts to worship the Lord. He brings an offering. You put your all on the altar today. The offering the Lord requires under the new covenant is very simple. That pleases God, present your body a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God. 
It's your reasonable service and worship. Just give it all. Trust the Lord. Give it all. In this moment, God gives him this word of go in this thy might. You go to, I believe once we make this surrender of our heart and life, we'll see how present God really is. And I believe we'll start getting a word from God. It'll be a clear word of grace and direction. And then Gideon, he went out to do what the Lord called him to do. <laughs> we'll pick that up next week. <laughs> we'll pick it up next week. But he set out in a task that would take God and had to learn very quickly when he thought he had it all figured out, God said, oh, that's too many. What do you mean too many? Many nights come in here like locusts. Too many. Cut this thing down. Well, what a lesson we learn from the fact that we do need God. Let me close with this one scripture. One of my favorite passages from the Gospel of John. He that hath my word, my commandments, keeps them, has me a faith walk. He it is that loves me. And he that loves me shall be loved of me and my Father. And I will love him and I will manifest myself to him. Oh, what a great passage. In other words, what I share with you, we have the word. We believe it. Let's trust it. Let's obey it. Let's follow it. We're just, and it's not a matter of religiosity. It's a matter of demonstrating and manifesting and simply put, just loving Jesus. That's what it is. I'm, I didn't love me. If you love me, you'll, you'll do this. It'll, that'll be the spontaneous. You don't do this to prove you love me. You do this because you love me. I already know if you love me. So just believe me. How do I do that? I just respond to what he's telling me. I believe him. So you know what? You want to see me? You want to hear from me? You do that. I'll show you. I'll show you. You may be in a place that you need to get a word from God. You may need some direction from the Father. My heart's cry is, is I am so much like Gideon. <laughs> and we all are, if we'll be honest. We just need to respond to what we already know. He had a reminder that day with an angel. But we have a reminder today from the Word, with his life and with his testimony. Let's respond to whatever the Lord is saying to us. This morning, I want you to stand with your heads bowed.